Welcome to Made in Science, the official podcast of the University of Stuttgart. My name is Wolfgang Holtkamp and I'm Senior Advisor on International Affairs at our University and also your host for another edition of this podcast. In this episode, we welcome our alumnus Dr. Tarek Zaki. Born and raised in Egypt, he studied electronics and information engineering at the German University in Cairo. After acquiring his bachelor's degree, he successfully completed the master's program Infotech, which is one of our English-speaking master programs. His academic education continued at the Institute for Microelectronics in Stuttgart and the University of Stuttgart, where he attained his PhD degree in nanotechnology and flexible electronics. Having worked for different companies in the past, he recently joined BMW as project manager and partner lead, being responsible for the cooperation with tech firms as well as developing future entertainment systems and vehicles. Throughout the years, Tarek has won many international awards for his achievements and authored various scientific articles. Today, we want to talk to him about his passion for creating lovable products, his way of working, and his way into and out of academia. Hello, Tarek. Hello. Thank you very much for the invitation. You are very welcome. As I just mentioned, you recently started a job at BMW in Munich. Can you tell us what it is all about? Yes, sure. So during my career, I had the opportunity to gain invaluable experience within the field of electronics and information engineering. Um, at first at Bosch, I worked on building miniaturized sensors, the tiny inner structures of which are smaller than the thickness of a hair. For example, together with my team at Bosch, we've developed the world's first four-in-one environmental sensor to measure pressure, temperature, humidity, and air quality to seize a groundbreaking opportunity for our users to safeguard their health against the rising environmental setbacks. All of this in just a fraction of centimeters in size. And now, at BMW, I currently work as a project manager and partner lead, as you've mentioned, to develop the next generation in-vehicle entertainment system for our fleet vehicles. The hardware software co-design system is envisioned to create a holistic connected experience with the user's consumer electronic ecosystem. If you were to describe your way of working, the Tarek way, if you want so, in a few sentences, what comes to your mind? What I'm very passionate about is to build lovable products. And it starts actually with the art of asking questions. You know, in today's always on and fast paced world, there's usually, I would say, a rush to answers. However, we often forget that we actually can't get the right answers unless we ask the right questions. And so in my team, we consider the skill as a superpower. We try to reward those who answer as well as those who ask. And so unlike the conventional wisdom, luckily chances in our environment tend to be higher not to jump quickly to conclusions and create poor decisions. Of course, we often inevitably create the first impression that we are slow, but it often pays off on the long term, you know, we often avoid a lot, a lot of unnecessary rework. And there are various kinds of questions such as, you know, elevating questions that raise broader issues and highlight the bigger picture to discover, or circular questions for even by asking what would your client say or what would your customer say, or the so-called magical questions, for example, by asking what if this problem would disappear from one day to another? And how would you realize that this problem disappeared? You know, this kind of questions endorses the focus on the future and on the goal to achieve instead of thinking how challenging the problem at hand is right now. And so it depends on the nature of the cooperation as well as the problem at hand. We try to steer the conversation with the right kind of questions. And in some cases, we want to expand, you know, our views of the problem, while in others, we want to challenge basic assumptions and affirm our understanding to feel, you know, more confident about our proposed solutions and conclusions. When you talk about your specific area of work, I have a feeling that you also try to think about the future and uh, what customers may have in mind and might want in the future. Um, how did you develop the interest in creating products that customers not only want, 
but perhaps also feel like needing. So, in my opinion, we shall always be obsessed by our customers when we develop new innovative products. You know, actually, it might even be the other way around. You know, it's the empathy and inclusion of our customers that spars our innovation as a team. And one of the famous examples was the typewriter. You know, it was the Italian inventors Pellegrino Tour who created the typewriter to enable communication with his lover, uh, who was sadly beginning to lose her vision. Back then, the typewriter gave them a way to communicate private messages. Today, the technology evolved to keyboards, a tool that we literally use every day. And I can name various other examples where love and care, you know, paved the way for technological revolution. And for complex products, so to say, this need grows, you know. You may imagine that getting our products in the hands of users with different abilities, age, character, gender, or whatsoever, will provide new insights for how our users interact with our technology. That is why as soon as we start thinking about problems and solutions, it's important to us to make sure that we always have the diversity or spectrum of users needed for valuable feedback. And that feedback can change the entire course of our plan, you know. For example, Frisbees yeah, were originally pie containers. And another funny example is the bubble, bubble wraps. You know, bubble wraps were first invented in Switzerland as, you won't believe it, wallpapers. Needless to say that it didn't sell well until customers found a completely different useful purpose for the product. Another striking example I witnessed in my hometown was the mobile network operators. It happened to be that financially limited mobile users used to call, but just to you know ring to the others uh, once seeking or asking them to call back. And this was unfortunately loading the network bandwidth tremendously. And so the MNOs has adapted the customer needs by you know creating a free SMS service called Call Me Thank You. And it was simply a win-win deal. And by the way, understanding your buyer's persona in the first place is not only of tremendous value to our team, but can be also super surprising. Do you know, for example, what's the average age of a Rolls-Royce customer? I think the age will not be young. It's strikingly actually 40-something, you know. So to sum up, introducing to the market the what I call minimum lovable product uh, is, is basically just the beginning, you know. A good product development team is one that gets inspired from observing the customers, how do they interact with the product, how do they struggle with it, and a team that continuously improves by collecting and analyzing customer data generating, uh, generated from using its product. On the other hand, a bad development team is one that fires and forget, a team that is tempted to blindly follow the hippos, so to say, which are the highest paid person's opinion instead of their customers. Do you ever also follow what movies present of the future, science fiction, for instance, or science fiction texts? Very often, uh, I guess, we find out only later, uh, many years later, when we see, oh, but we've watched it, uh, we saw it already. And now it's a much more approachable, a much more lovable project, product for that matter. Is that any inspiration at your end at all? Or is that a nice side effect, rather? It's definitely a, a nice observation that we witness when we watch uh, entertainment, particularly in the, let's say, in the field of my work on daily basis, where we actually want to incorporate entertainment in our vehicles. And that's the most, let's say, valuable income or input to, to our inspirations. Before coming to the University of Stuttgart for pursuing your master's degree, You studied electronics and information engineering at the German University in Cairo, the GUC. Professors from the University of Stuttgart, but also the University of Ulm and Tübingen University often teach at the GUC. Why did you decide to go for that university and also for that particular subject? So I pursued actually my undergraduate and graduate degrees, as you've mentioned, at the German University in Cairo and the University of Stuttgart, respectively. Yeah, looking back at my education journey has, I would say, stricken a chord of nostalgia. Yeah, it's like an ocean of knowledge and memories that embraced a meandering yet steep pathway to, you know, oneself. I learned to explore science at ever greater breadth and depth. And of course, I'm in awe 
of my beloved teachers for setting the primary bricks of my professional career. I actually have the implicit belief that my success today traces its lineage to them. Um, why I studied engineering? Uh, from my perspective, I studied electronics engineering and information te technology due to um, several reasons. First, and probably the most important one, it offers endless career opportunities because it simply finds application in nearly all fields and industries, starting from agriculture, transportation and health, to security, automotive and aerospace. And second, with the ever-increasing amount of single board computers and off-the-shelf modules such as Arduino, it became relatively easy, you know, to rapidly build prototypes and establish startups in order to tackle the vital challenges that our ecosystem is currently facing. And third, this degree enables to learn various interesting skills, you know, this includes not only modeling, programming, fabricating and testing to build cool and lovable products, but also learning how to learn, you know, and the latter is, in my opinion, quite essential nowadays when technology is advancing at an unprecedented rate. And in my doctorate research, I've developed at that time the world's fastest organic electronics, a technology that was long thought to be a science fiction by collaborating with many renowned scientists at the University of Stuttgart, at IMS Chips, or Institute of, uh, for Microelectronics Stuttgart, and the Max Planck Institute as well, all in Stuttgart. We've been able to build electronic circuits on glasses, plastics, and papers, the application of which are just limited by one's ingenuity. Why did you then choose to leave academia and transfer to the business world? Although being such a successful researcher with um, everything you have done so far, Simply put, I was very keen to bring the knowledge that I have into practice and build uh, products that people, including myself, would use it. You have won many awards, among others, an Alumni Achievement Award from the German University in Cairo. Your PhD thesis was included in the prestigious Springer Thesis Collection. What do awards and acknowledgements mean to you? So I'm of course honored that my contributions have been well recognized by several international awards but what is actually most valuable is the I would say the privilege to have worked with the amazing and wonderful and knowledgeable people uh, in my circle and what is close to my heart is actually the passion to push innovation beyond its boundaries and create uh, the so-called lovable products all with the purpose, of course, of benefiting humanity. And just to give you an example, I hope that my contribution, even if little, by building the world's smallest environmental sensors in an attempt to make them ubiquitous, is making a significant impact and helps to improve the situation for our society. Since we have already tried to look a little bit ahead of our time, what do you think will be the future of mobility and what might be the role of the car in the whole overall picture of mobility? Yeah, so mobility is experiencing an unprecedented advancement. You know, competition is getting fiercer and fiercer. At the International Mobility Show this year, we've revealed at BMW the so-called iVision Circular. You might have heard of it. It has been designed according to the circular economy principles, according to the board, and therefore symbolizes the BMW's ambitious plan to become the world's most sustainable manufacturer in the individual premium mobility space. The vehicle achieves 100% use of recycled materials, and this includes even the energy storage device, you know, the all solid state battery in the BMW iVision Circular is 100% recyclable and manufactured almost entirely using materials sourced from the recycling loop. So all of that very sustainable. Uh, also, having talked about the objects, um, what about the person? What is your goal for the future? Do you have a next step in mind um, already? Or is it enough at, for the moment, uh, enough in inverted commas, to work on the future? as you do. Personally, I'd love to stay student for life, uh, or in other words, stay hungry and foolish, as Steve Jobs once quoted it from the renowned magazine, The Whole Earth Catalog.
Tarek, towards the end of our talk, we have a section called Moment 7. We have collected seven questions that we would like to ask you and we also would like to answer in a very, very brief fashion, if possible. Here is Moment 1. Spätzle or Maultaschen? Spätzle. Moment 2. One thing you could change about the world. High-end, lovable, yet affordable education system. Moment three. Do you have a book recommendation for us? Mm, to Have or To Be by Erich Fromm or Homodeus by Harari. Moment four. The best advice you have ever received was? My father has told me that an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. Moment five. The favorite place on campus during your studies here in Stuttgart was? Mm, the nearby Univisa Lake and its surroundings. Moment six. If I could start all over again, I would do the following differently. I would have enriched uh, my passion for riding horses more. And moment seven. Please complete the following sentence. The best thing about Stuttgart is is that it shaped me. It's where I spend almost one third of my life. Thank you for having answered our uh, short questions here and, uh, and offered us uh, also more insights into your world of technology, but also of uh, staying a student all through your life. I think uh, that is a very noble approach and uh, we all wish you the very best of luck uh, for that. But most of all, thanks for having been our guest today in our podcast here. Um, we wish you every possible success in the future and in your professional career. Um, goodbye and auf Wiedersehen from Stuttgart. Thanks for hosting me. It has been my pleasure.